Each Sunday night, I'd watch the practice with none of my friends. I'd turn the dial to ABC to see the creep of the week that Bobby Donald defends. But I'm out of practice. With your host, Keith Barney. And Leo. Way back in high school, most every night, my mom watched QVC, so I Why missed the practice. There was no TV. What could I do? Bing. Wait 15 years, get fat, then stream it. Out of it's Monday. I'm going to be on the mic for six hours today. Beg me not to sing today. And welcome to the Out of Practice Podcast, a weekly podcast in which me, uh, Keith Varney, and my buddy Mike talk about the practice. David E. Kelly's award-winning series. This week we are talking about season seven, episode 20. Heroes and villains. Mike, do you know we have only two more episodes after this one for all of season seven? I'm really excited about it, Keith. And I think it's about time we let people know the plan for season eight. Yeah. I think I think it's time to break the news now. Okay. Do, do, would you like to do it or would you I'll like me to it. be the bad guy? No, no, it's okay. It's not a bad guy. Uh, so, guys, you know, we looked at the metrics and... Mm-hmm. Um, Nobody watches the YouTube. No. Uh, and people actually listen to the podcast. They do. And, and so we really have to look at our work to life ratio and yeah. put our efforts, and efforts I use in lower case because, it's, <laughs> uh, and, and just uh, focus. So we're going to keep the YouTube toys show going. We've got some other ideas we're going to spin off. And we are going to obviously see this thing through. Of because course. We committed, and it's maybe one of the only things I've ever committed to in my life and followed through with. And uh, we're going to just go back audio only for season eight. We are going to, also, of course, do the season end oopsies for uh, right. this season and next season. And, you know, for some reason, if there's a, re- a special episode or whatever. And, of course, the grand finale, which we haven't talked about really yet and discussed. But whatever the grand finale is for this podcast, we will, mm-hmm, of course... Mm-hmm. Do on our video series well. finale, yes, and whatever that ends up being, yeah, yeah. And trust me when I say Keith and I are not going anywhere. Uh, we have lots of silly, stupid things we are going to be doing, but we just thought, uh, as thankfully life is getting back up to speed, uh, we we we're gonna save the extra Michigas that this the it's it's not your fault, people who watch. It's all the people who don't. <laughs> Wow, way to, uh, yeah, I, I, <laughs> I, I like somehow that you turn, hold on, I have to let the cat into the window. Uh, I love how you, you turned our, uh, our, our laziness into a guilt trip to, to them. I, I really appreciate that. I think that's a... Uh, well, I mean, that, I mean that was, that was well the truth of the matter is, is that this, we, it takes us two to two and a half hours to film it. It takes me probably another three to, to make, I mean, it's a whole... It's a it's a whole thing, which I enjoy, but it it's uh, not there's we can be using that time for other things. Yes, indeed. And frankly, uh, the reality is nobody cares. So why don't we? <laughs> That's the truth. Yeah. Why don't Why don't we move forward? I I I, I uh, we 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 have a lot to get to today. But uh, right. I will say I'm very proud of myself this week. Uh, I'm I'm a relatively handy guy for a musical theater professional. But as a as a dude, you know, it's uh, cars are a mystery to me. But I was very proud to have uh, replaced our uh, our headlight bulbs yesterday. So oh, great, I buddy. was, uh, yeah, I like popped the the hood and everything, and uh, and swapped out the bulbs, and it even worked. I was I was pretty excited about that. I had a, a pretty big breakthrough this week too. Uh, uh, it's it's gonna, well, we'll see maybe. So I don't know if I've talked too much about it on the air, but I've been having some vocal issues going on a year, two years now, 
Whereas a part of my range, which has always been very, very easily accessible to me, they call it the flip falsetto, and it's been something very, very easy for me. Um, mm -hmm. But over the past two-ish years, uh, about D5 through F5, has that has been usually my, you know, a very pingy, nasally right. sound, has uh, on, sometimes not been there at all, and sometimes made this weird like rattle which I thought for sure was a physical issue. I went to an right. ENT, they couldn't find anything. So recently, as being an old guy, I've had to go on some medications, one of them being a blood pressure medicine because my genetics are shit. And mm. one of these side effects of uh, blood pressure medication, it's also a beta blocker. So it sort of regulates your adrenaline and your blood pressure and your heart rate. And what I, on a gig this past weekend, I found that also, when I rehearse, because I live in an apartment, I, I sing it half voice a lot, and I mark a lot, which right. there's certain things in your voice, Keith, you can attest to as as you really have that really crazy mix. You can't you can't rehearse that not at 100%, because otherwise right. you can actually- Right, there's some things you can only do at 100%. You, you That's put right. it here, and this is death with tension here as a singer. Oh, yeah, no, and that can really, like- fuck things up yeah yeah because your body remembers muscle memory and then when you get stressed out you go to these really tense places long story short i had a string of gigs this past weekend um and on this medication and with some really supportive castmates i was able to sort of let her rip a little bit and i found that sound that was happening but then i was able to get past it and then i i i felt a sort of a click where i was able to find my mask again which singers will understand mm. and Though I'm a little older and it's a little harder than it used to be and there's some rerouting that needs to take place. Once I got there, it was back. Well, I, you know, I've always said that if you, if you know where to place something, right? You know, this isn't just like willy nilly. Like if you actually know where you're going, it really, it's all about commitment. And it's, it's about full energy without tension when i mm -hmm. when i'm teaching voice like it's all i i always use the analogy of like a baseball swing right where you are putting all of your energy into a fluid motion you're not you're not tensing anything you're not pushing against anything but your entire body is completely committed to a baseball swing that you're constantly in motion there's no tension but complete and total commitment and effort and uh same way you hit a home run is, is how you uh, sing it correctly. So, uh, so even though I'm trying to back out of uh, doing a lot more of these gigs, uh, the fact that I was able to kind of get, uh, realize that I'm not broken was, uh, that lifts a weight. It lifts a weight. Oh, for me. sure. So, yeah. Well, that's exciting. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, 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 uh, you know, when in the basement here, because I'm not performing anywhere, uh, what I'm recording, basically, I just like, I'm just, refuse to not hit the note it's like liza minnelli just like ah, i'm just gonna do it and then i'm not even gonna think about it and uh, most of the times that works so and sometimes it doesn't in a spectacular fashion uh somewhere so on jen told me to drive. rest and she says you also talk too loud and too much and she's right i realized that i'm mm. i'm underutilizing my mask in my speaking voice and doing all these podcasts and sitting down and working for the past few years you sort of start to live here yeah. um and the truth is this is where i talk so i need to get back up there get up there man uh, I've, I've been, uh, I've been talking up here for, you know, 17 years. My, uh, I think, I don't think my voice ever really fully changed, but, uh, you know what people would really like to change, uh, the, the topic the format, of our conversation yeah, you're absolutely right. <laughs> and they would like to, uh, us to change to our very important segment. Filings and subpoenas. Well, okay, so we have heard, uh, as I talk too loudly here in the basement, we have heard, of course, from, I'm gonna, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to deal with you. I'm just going to bring the mic up here, and I'm going to yeah, talk in my NPR Gross, voice. Yeah, let's go a little Terry Terry Gross style. Okay. So, uh, according to the YouTubes, of which Phoenix Cage is a moderator, he weighed in on our last episode. That last episode, of course, being less is more. Um, and uh, there were some Instagram comments about that not being a favorite episode. And uh, Mike also says, Mike, I'm with you. It's really hard to know how you'd handle being cheated on until it happens. Years ago, I made a list of rules. The only three things someone could do to make me immediately end a relationship. Interestingly, cheating isn't one of them. 
It's not that I wouldn't end the relationship because of it. In fact, I actually did end the relationship after one time it happened. I kind of suspect that not adding it to the list might be hubris. That if someone were capable of cheating, I'd already know it. That if the relationship ever started getting bad enough that my partner was thinking about other people, I'd have... I'd have to course, I'd have course corrected. But then again, maybe it's not hubris. See, my number one rule is honesty. With me, there are no lies, including lies of omission. Anyone who can handle that rule will build a relationship on trust, and a relationship with that foundation is unlikely to end in cheating. Interesting. That's an, I've, I've never really codified a set of rules like that. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I feel like for me, everything would have to be on a case by case basis. Cause it's like, it's, I don't know, like if she killed my cat, then I think that would be a deal breaker, but <laughs> it would be, I don't know. It's complicated, Mike. What do you think? It is complicated. And as I get older, much to, I think what, to what Phoenix was saying there, well, as I've gotten older, I've realized that rules are tough for me because my, I've learned that I am not as smart as I give myself credit for emotionally. Meaning that if I if I do not have direct empathy for something, meaning I have experienced it myself, I, I fool myself to assume how I would react or how someone should react. So if I I, I, I actually emotionally my into, my emotional intelligence these days, I like to upfront when I'm talking to someone who's going through some someone codify everything with I either I can't empathize with you I sympathize I can't empathize I haven't gone through this so I I feel like maybe mm. you know because I just I've learned the more I know the more I don't know so yeah everything we talked about last week was was pure speculation because I I, I haven't been cheated on or I've dated some really great cheaters but, I mean yeah. it's true it's they're they're either yeah they could they could just be excellent at it yeah it's Which, like you know what you know, okay I mean, to be fair, I don't, I don't have any evidence that you're a serial killer, but that's not exculpatory. You might just be a very good one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the truth is, not the not the truth. It, we could we <laughs> could phrase our conversation on the show more like more or less that you know we really are disappointed with Bobby because he's such a he's he's got such a wandering eye, and we could just we could state for the record he's just a terrible cheat. I mean, he his flirting is so on the nose. His 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 cheats are with people he dated. He lets Lindsay watch yeah, him. He's going no, taking it's, her to restaurants. It's terrible. He's not a good liar either. He's bad. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, neither is Rebecca. Apparently, he's uh, nobody yeah, that, on the show. That, that, well, you know, if, if everyone was a good liar, it'd be bad TV. And it, you would because think nobody as would ever discover attorneys, anything. You'd think they'd be good at it, but they're not. So uh, Phoenix also has a comment on Annie McDowell's character uh, from, of course, Less Is More. Uh, Mike, I will help you sum up Andy McDowell's character. She pretended to be malevolent with fake bombs and a fake cannon to teach us all a lessons. If the Joker was chaotic good, he'd be her. Uh, that is a very good wow. uh, observation, especially if you're a D&D &D person, because that's a character alignment in Dungeons and Dragons, which is one of the reasons that I'm on the mic for six hours today, because we're going to do this for... Uh, Two and a half hours, and then we're going to do toys for at least an hour, and then uh, I'll have three hours of D and D tonight. Uh, I, I I just Heath, I have a little D and D surprise for you in a in a few moments. I, do I'm not you gonna spoil it past that yet? Uh, uh, oh, I'm excited. Also, I spoke to a, a colleague that I will not name because we put this on the internet. Mm -hmm. uh, in reference to this episode, as a matter of fact, uh, and their comment was, and and it gave me pause for thought. Truth be told. This person said they don't that Andy McDowell, though lovable and and very charismatic and and sweet, uh, never has really enjoyed any of her performances. Really finds her not to uh, not to be worth the hype. And to which I thought, well, that's a valid criticism. I I could see it. Interesting. Could see it. She thinks interesting. Uh, yeah. All right. Well. Uh, yeah. I, I I'll be curious uh, to to hear who that was. I mean. Uh, it was, was it James person. Snyder? Yeah, you oh, don't know okay. this person. Uh, all right. <laughs> Let us move forward. Folks, if you would like to join the conversation, uh, Mike, how would they do that? Oh, Keith, I, I, I would love to tell them. As a matter mm. of fact, 
It's very simple to do so. Uh, I thought. Oh, there we go. Yeah, it's contact yeah, us. There you go. At out of practice podcast at gmail.com, at out of practice podcast on Facebook or on Instagram. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, I think it is time to hop back into the time machine and talk about uh, what was going on. Uh, this day in the basement. Of course, we are talking about April 21st, the year 2003. Uh, you know, Mike, what were you up to? Keith, I was getting ready to graduate from college. Uh, but what I was really doing in my apartment in Harlem, New York, with my friend Jason, see, we didn't have cable, but we did invest in a Nintendo GameCube, and I was playing ah. one of my favorite games of all time. I think I've talked about it before. Jason and I used to pass the controller back and forth and like play games jointly, which was really cool. I miss him because my wife doesn't play games with me, so I miss JJ. Uh, and we were playing one of my favorite games of all time. I'm talking about... The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. Oh, look and at I that. remember this game came out on the the very underpowered Nintendo GameCube, and I thought for sure that this was the peak of what graphics could do. Could ever I was, do. I was playing a full motion video cartoon. Uh, what was funny is that they hid a lot of loading screens and stuff behind just endless sailing upon the ocean, which was just like two colors, and so they could load things in the background. You spent right, right. hours literally just sailing, 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 sailing. But this game took hours. You used the, the little, the, the awesome Nintendo GameCube, which was like this big. It came with a little CD. It was on a CD-ROM. This is one of those mini CDs. Uh, thanks oh, to yeah. Philip948, by the way, for the for the video. And yeah, this is what we spent uh, months of time. April through, for, for a little before April, actually. But I remember April's the big month we spent playing it as we were getting ready for final juries. And so uh, I'll never forget, back in 2003, April, me and Jason sitting on Indian style, or I can't say that, crisscross applesauce on the carpet, playing The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker. It was a great time. I mean, that's awesome. And, and uh, if I remember correctly, the uh, we we played that GameCube a fair amount. Oh yeah, like the you know I think for the it next did travel year. With me, yeah, yeah, because well, and and when you were when we were in Brooklyn, we would use your stolen projector and play Madden on the wall. Was well, not stolen, borrowed. Was it ever returned? No, but I'm not sure it was expected to be. So that's stolen. So that's stolen. I don't think. I think if I'm not mistaken, it fell off the back of a truck. <laughs> okay well yeah anyway well i'm i'm excited because we next next season we're actually going to be able to talk about a little bit of that where it, it's sort of the it's interesting because the finale of the practice is going to coincide with our meeting and right. uh, and because i actually we're probably not going to get to when you moved in at brooklyn no. but uh the series finale of the practice is going to happen when we were just finishing up tour. Hmm. Yeah, well, it, th our last video episode, well, second penultimate video episode, which will be this season's Oopsie Awards or season Oopsies, I'll get to talk about this summer uh, when I do Forever Plaid. So we'll get to actually see a little clip of that. So that'll be good. Oh, great! Yeah, because because uh, now if you're if you're if you're listening at home, mom, and be like. Didn't he talk about doing Forever Plaid and graduating from college? Yeah, he did because uh, it had a little bit of a snafu about what year was what year. So, uh, so get ready. It, you know, we're we're already in syndication, so we're sort of doing reruns. Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's just so, light topics like emotional repression and yeah, uh, smoking yeah, yeah. a lot of pot. So there you go. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. So uh, what I was doing, going back in the emails, it, this is a little bit of a cheat. So forgive me, okay. uh, but. This week, uh, we were emailing setting up an event I'm going to talk about, and that was the retirement of my high school music teacher. Uh, her name was Andrea Hollenbeek, and she, she, her name is still Andrea Hollenbeek. Um, but uh, so she was name. continues to be that name. Um, but she was a uh, my high school music teacher, chorus teacher. She music directed all the theater shows, and we were. 
um we were very close in, in high school we were I, I i would i considered her a friend um throughout that time period and we did we spent endless hours at the various festivals and this that the other thing um and interestingly she had worked with my mother my mother was also a uh a teacher and there was a very famous strike in the early 80s in Heinsberg, and uh, she was actually teaching at that school so she was a member um of the Heinsberg 28 or i forget what the number was but anyway so long history and she was finally retiring um this year and uh, after a wildly successful um completely revitalizing the music department at at mount mansfield where i went to high school um and uh had done all of this tremendous work and uh so she was retiring that year so some of us alums decided to come back for the final concert um of the high school season and do a little um and and uh perform in like an alumni chorus and then uh, me and my buddy nate we performed a song for her at that final retirement concert which was really really sweet and really fun and i i really uh enjoyed doing it and appreciated it uh, although i look back on it now it's and i'm a little embarrassed because uh of the song selection right so i was eyes? going i was <laughs> that would have made sense it would have made more sense than what i did I, I was in a huge like billy joel phase at that point she's got away and and i sang she's got away which on first thought yeah that makes sense and then you're like oh wait that's that's not really about like a generic person who's awesome uh, that's a love song and uh no, it, very I, specifically <laughs> Very much so. And I, I don't think that really dawned on me at this point. And I'm like, just like singing it. And I'm, ugh. So it's a little embarrassing when I think about it. You're it blushing, did, did buddy. sound a little bit like I was seducing my old music teacher, which I very much was not, but it was pretty. Or maybe you're you know, just embarrassed because it didn't work. I, it's, it, you don't know it didn't work. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, I, I blame, I blame my buddy Nate. He should have told me. He's, he's usually the person who, like, you know, tells me when I'm being an idiot and he and he didn't he played the piano he is Nate. complicit he is complicit on, in what happened there so uh anyway so that was a uh, that was the experience I was having so now I think it's time to uh zoom back out and take a little bit of a journey through the history of the world it's time for the Out of Practice Podcast's This Day in the World. The greatest hits, the biggest movies, headlines from Vermont, essential sports updates, and for some inexplicable reason, the weather from 20 years ago. Now back to Keith and Mike. Okay, folks. This was April 21st, the year 2003. We were still listening to In the Club. And uh, this is, uh, oh, I can't hear this version. You can't hear it? I can't hear it. I don't care if I can't hear it. What's important to me is our is our loyal oh, the people hear it. can hear it. Uh, Keith, this if is the, the Indie Club it, that's all that Medieval Bardcore version uh, by Beetle the Bardcore. Love it. I'm sure it's Oh, hold it's on. Amazing. I got you, buddy. No, you don't. Now I hear myself. Oh. Ooh. It's me in stereo. That's, can't you hear that's that? not that's good. Not good to me. It's not good for the world. All right. Well, anyway. keep going. The uh, cover of the Burlington Free Press, because as we were barreling through the war, was Marines move out of Baghdad. Because uh, we had, in the subsequent week, we had taken Baghdad, and now we were moving forward. Uh, yeah, that was all still happening. The top movie was Anger Management, which uh, was in its second week of domination. Took in $25 million. Oh, now I'm hearing in the club. It's finally coming. All right. So, uh, of course, that was an Ad Adam Sandler, Jack Nicholson movie. Uh, yeah, that was just a movie that happened. All <laughs> right. Was. Well, <laughs> I think I saw that. It was like a mobster, right? It wasn't good. It wasn't good. All right. Well, you know what was good? Everyone's favorite segment. It's time. It's time. time. It's, time. it's time for sports. Sports. The NHL playoffs were in full swing, and the New Jersey Devils eliminated the Boston Hockey Bruins four games to one. Boo! 
The Flyers, meanwhile, had a terrific series against the Toronto Maple Leafs, with the series going to Game 7, where the Flyers won 6-1, sending them to a second-round matchup against the Ottawa Senators. Wow. Hey, man. Very, very exciting. All right, uh, you know what it is? You know what it's time for? I'm a human being, God damn it! My life has value, and I'm not going to take this anymore! It's time to talk about the damn episode! Okay, once again, Season 7, Episode 20, Heroes and Villains. This was written by David E. Kelly, but uh, I have some exciting news about who directed it. Mike, have you looked at the sheet yet to find... Is, has it been spoiled for you? No. Let me guess. Okay. okay. A cast member. <clears throat> yes! It is Lisa Gay Hamilton directed this episode. Thank God. And interestingly, this and the documentary that she directed about Bea Richards are the only two directing credits she has. Huh. Both happened within the same year. And of course, Bea Richards, you will remember, a oopsie winner uh, and Emmy winner for the practice the previous season. So uh, very, very interesting and uh, exciting to have Lisa Gay Hamilton to helm this episode that we are, are about to view with our eyeballs. And if you would like to view it with your earballs, it is now time to switch over to your podcasting service of choice and we will yeah, see you back to, here. I on... don't get to tell you what I think is going to happen. Oh crap, I forgot about that. Uh Jesus. all right. What uh you know, what does yeah, yeah, this thing. I forgot oh, our format. It's only thing, yeah. okay. it's episode 154 and I forgot our format. What's your problem? Is this well, what happens to women when you insert your We're in good hands, Lisa Gay, right? What? What does Mike think's gonna happen? You know, what if he would have drank the curdled milk? Then what would have happened? Mm. The the previously on is interesting because we we see a recap of Eugene and Jamie discussing her uh, her coming to terms with her recent rape. We also see the Bobby and Lindsay crap, and then we see the. The Lindsay, I forget the guy's name, but like the delivery guy, the delivery guy serial killer. Ah, uh, yes. The costumed delivery guy serial killer. So those are three. <laughs> oh, that's right. The costume change specialist. <laughs> those are three Stanley crazy, Deeks. crazy plot points to try to squeeze into an episode. Uh, but I, under Lisa's deft hand, I think we can pull it off. I think. <clears throat> Jamie's going to get her chance to testify against her accuser, or, or her, mm -hmm. no, I'm sorry, against her rapist. But. But. but there's conflict because mm. he is represented by the law firm of. Well, hold on. It would be crazy if. Lindsay is tapped to defend him. No, she doesn't do that though anymore, does she? She sometimes she does. She doesn't do criminal. She does civil, but we don't know that it's. But in in your hypothetical case, it could be civil. Because I'm just saying that, like, it would be crazy if, let's say, Lindsay is defending him. So that's creating conflict with her and Jamie and like the offices, and then mm -hmm. they get him off, but somehow. Lindsay then convinces serial killer murderer to kill him so he gets his oh, just desserts anyway. She sends him out on another hit. Yeah, baby. So A it's like we close hit. the circle. We get the win and we get the win, if you know what Ooh, I'm saying. Oh, okay. All right. Well, all right. I'd watch that episode. We're about uh, to, buddy. We're about yes. to. Yes. So uh, about all the stuff that I just said about the podcasting and blah, 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 we'll be back for the oopsies. And we are b -b 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 back, baby. We are indeed. Okay, well, uh, there we are in that episode. Mike, why don't you tell us what happened? Mm, two, three, four. Mike has 30 seconds to remember what just happened on the show. Segment, segment. So Deeks is back. He's mad at Lindsay because she tells everybody that for 
that she leaked the information, but like put her stamp on it, though she didn't have to do it, but she did it. And then he kills himself, and then she feels bad, so she they play sad music, and she has a funeral. Bobby decides last week that he wants to. He really only loves Lindsay. He wants to work it out with her, but she's like, "I'm taking the kid," so he fucks that other chick anyway. Mm-hmm. And uh, Lindsay almost rape shames uh, Stringer, but he doesn't, and then the rapist gets convicted. Uh, Eugene almost does, yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. It might as well yeah. have been Bobby, but yes, Eugene. Might as well, might as well. All right, uh, can you... That was riveting. Is there any <laughs> chance you can do it again, but, you know, in fewer syllables? In a segment we call... Jane, I'm doing this on the fly because I forgot. Jamie is plan A. Huh? Good. Bobby went and still fucked her. (laughs) Yep. Lindsay is wrote bad. Yeah. <laughs> Lindsay is wrote bad, folks. There it is. It's now official. Uh, okay. Uh yeah. Well, uh before we get wrote bad, why don't we uh, go into our fake award show? Ladies and gentlemen, the Out of Practice podcast in unofficial unsolicited unfactual association with David E. Kelly Productions proudly present Oopsie. The Oopsies. Celebrating excellence in acting good, lawyering good, guesting good, and being Tom Brady. Not to mention, this is where we rate the episode and stuff. Now, here are your hosts, Keith and Mike. What the hell are the Oopsies? Well, Jackie, they're everybody's fake award show all about the practice, which begin with... Most Valuable <laughs> At least I was having a good time. <laughs> <laughs> um, well... Uh, you know, Eugene did the right thing. He did. But for the wrong person. Well, depend. I mean, from a legal standpoint. Um, but he did, he did find a way to, you know, as a, okay, hold on. As a lawyer, he, he didn't get the desired outcome for his client. However, he did get his, arguably his desired a- outcome. Mm-hmm. Which is his guy behind bars and his friendship saved and and retribution for his friend by using his lawyer ring by omission. But that's a mm-hmm. that's quite a stretch. Well, it's a I'll, stretch. But here I'm gonna I'm gonna back this up. Okay. Right. I'm gonna say he did the right thing legally in the big picture, in the long run, mm-hmm. because uh, certainly. Uh, slut shaming victims of rape is an injustice mm-hmm. and our legal system as a picture as, as a, in the big picture is designed to create justice to stand up for victims and so in this case the way the legal system was administered then and probably still today is an injustice and therefore not working towards its own purpose so he was actually doing the right legal thing in the bigger picture, in the in in the eyes of time, in the eyes of history, the annals so, in the annals of history. So for my my vote, it's going to be Eugene. All right, great. Uh, all right, well, congratulations, Eugene, on your M B L. Where's my button? Here it is. There it is. All right, moving on. Get ready to dance. Already famous because you've been on TV. Getting a paycheck. Or the first entry on your IMDb. Way to go. But you're the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor. You are the best guest actor on the episode. I 
I mean, can Mis- we just keep giving it to this guy? I mean, to uh, to John Bader. I, I don't love the character. I, I he's doing great, but like I just don't look. I mean, it's re- not it's not uh, best guest character. It's best guest actor. It's a tough character. I mean, they really they really asked him to like, despite the sheer monster we've made you. Can you really seem sick and sad this episode? Mm-hmm. Can we can you make audiences buy it? And here's the here's the thing, Keith. I don't buy it. Clearly, we don't buy it. But I can't fault him for that. It would have taken an uh, an actor of a caliber uh, that is not maybe even alive to to have sold that sold that snake oil. Uh, so, but. Uh, I don't really. You know, I thought that the the guest uh, attorney for the rape case was 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 a good actress, serviceable. Mm-hmm. Susan Floyd. But listen, also we've all been there where we're handed. I had to dress up like a pizza one time, Keith. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I had to dress up like a slice of pizza and do a tango called the refrigerator tango. That's a thing ah. I had to do. And yes, it was satire and pistache, so it gave me somewhere to go. But at the end of the day, I was dressed in a pizza costume, dancing. Yeah. There's only so much you can do. But you know what? I did my That's job. Right. You did. And the audience laughed. And yeah. And uh, that's what that's ostensibly what our boy Bader did. So I'm going to say he deserves that slice of pepperoni. I I think so too. I mean, honestly, I I I don't think we're searching for a different actor. I think we're searching for different writing. And I thought he did a great job. I, I mean, given what he was given, given the dancing pizza of it all, mm-hmm. uh, and look, we've all had to do the dancing pizza job, and uh, he did really good. I actually really like the moment where he said, "I'm, I'm very much not happy," which we saw an element of scary from him, mm-hmm. which we didn't really see a lot, and I appreciated having that touch of actual menace there as opposed to. I'm sort of like cute and dopey and kill off screen. So, uh, yeah. yeah sure. So, good job, Mr. Bader. Congratulations on your oopsie. All right. You know what it's time for? It's time to start leaking those tears. You killed your podiatrist or blew the case, but you let a single tear run down your face. Via You're cellular. The best actor on. Show. Those are your, you got a nice hotspot going, Keith. Yeah, it's not too. It, it, well, I, I'm on my my own wireless. I'm usually jacked in hardwired with the second uh, with a second router, but something's something's gone wrong between router oh, so one and have, router so two. So your so you're, the pipe is hot. You're just not getting you're not getting the feed downstairs. It's not talking to the to the my local router. I don't know. I'm gonna have to work on it when we're done. Double net situation, maybe. Anyway, um. I think I think you know I don't know her name. Who plays Jamie? <laughs> uh, how do you not know that, Michael? I just don't. I mean, come on, she's like she's a Spielberg, almost. Well, <laughs> she's a Spielberg, almost. Well, her mother married Steven Spielberg, and uh, and so she is the daughter. It is, of course, Jessica Capshaw. Yes, Jessica Capshaw. Not not a stranger to the Oopsies. No, she she was great this episode. That's a that's a tough needle to thread. She was playing the the past, but also this sort of betrayal by Eugene. And mm-hmm. you know, one scene that specifically stands out for me is when he brings her in and he's sort of cross examining her in the office about her partners. And she starts by answering. And by justifying herself and ex- explaining herself, and then there's a moment where she realizes, or at least I see in the performance, a realization that I don't fucking need to. I don't need to explain this to you, and she yeah. stands up to go. And that defiance there is really important, I think, and I think it's sort of the kind of central crux of the, the of what I think we're trying to say, in that, regardless of your history, regardless of your past and the decisions you've made. That can be used against you in a court of law. In this type of case, in that moment, your decision to say no, despite your past, despite what you could infer about the table setting of the scenario you're in, if you say no, 
that's the cut and that's rape. Well, no, yeah, no, for sure. Um, and you don't need to explain that to anybody. And I'm saying that like I, I felt all of that subtext and all of that, or just not subtext, the actual plot, um, well delivered in that sort of defiance. But it wasn't over the top. You know, it's easy to go too far. It's easy to underplay it. You really felt yeah. all of the different nuance without having to have it written in the script. And and I think she was absolutely, uh, she absolutely nailed it. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought she did that a tremendous job. That moment in the court, job. too, where her and Eugene just looked at each other was pretty yeah. powerful, too. Yeah, and I, I thought she did a tremendous job. And I, and I uh, But I, I think I'm going to give it to Steve. Um, yeah, okay. Because I, I think Eugene did an excellent job. Because so much of his thought process had to be nonverbal, right? He's denying what he's actually doing the whole time mm-hmm. to to Stringer, to Kittleson, to his client. Um, and so we had we have to be able to see all of the machinations of his decision making process subtextually and is in his performance, uh, which I thought he did a uh, terrific job. So congratulations, Jessica Capshaw. And Steve Harris on your oopsies. Last up, uh, he has uh, the Tom Brady Award for being Tom Brady. But not playing in the Super Bowl this year. I'm going to make it easy, Keith. Mm. Make it real easy. Mm. You know, Jamie didn't give us any crocodile tears this episode, but Tom Brady does. So the winner for this week's Tom mm. Brady Award for being Tom Brady is Crier Crier Baby Loser Tom Brady. <laughs> baby Loser Tom Brady. Love it. Love it. Love it. Uh, I have never seen Jillian more invested in sports than the last few seconds mm-hmm. of that game trying to get Tom Brady and to Keith, lose. If you end up doing actual graphics for these, and there's, uh, you know, like, don't kill yourself. Yeah, you know, yeah. maybe. Aaron Rodgers weeping in the background of that picture would also just put be the mm, wouldn't the cherry it on wouldn't top. be sad yeah he seems yeah. to have uh, you know uh, inoculated himself against yeah. uh, you know continuing yeah. forward in the playoffs bummer silenced silenced from further play mm, mm, I did my own research on the score and apparently you lost all right <laughs> ladies and gentlemen it is ten points minutes, how many spare tires this episode gets. <sighs> we've done a lot of stuff that is bizarre and doesn't make any sense. But here we are in stuff that like should make sense. The the everything we're saying in Jamie's case should make sense, but but just to get to where we got, it's just Eugene would never have taken that case. He just wouldn't have done it. I don't even believe that. Yeah. And and here's the thing, Kittleson, if nothing else, has shown that she's happy to be partial. You know what I mean? She's happy right. oh, to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And she's got her own conflicts of interest, and she knows us very well. There's no, she wouldn't force Eugene to, like, defend Jamie's rapist. Come on. But whatever. I thought that at least where that plot went and what it had to say was uh, noble, you know? And I thought we had got it, 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 along with the direction from Lisa Gay, brought out gr- some great performances by Jessica and and Steve, as we discussed before. So, all right. Um, the Lindsay serial killer thing, I, I can't even begin to parse what the hell the point of that was. I can't. Um, we've that 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 storyline, though clearly unfinished, we knew it. It was done. It was wrapped. I mean, yes, we didn't see the fallout of it, but we knew that that stinger of that episode. We knew what happened, and that was the best way to play that out and have that stinger. Right. Even though we hated that episode, <laughs> that have that stinger, and then let you know that's the end of that. That's that's the the spooky ending for that. To bring it back again. Did serve to do two things. One, draw out something that wasn't even interesting. Like, oh, he went back to school. Oh, he's and and is muddy at best. Uh, he really he was better, and now we're sad for him because he ends up killing himself because Jamie did the right thing that she should have, or um, Lindsay did the right thing she should have done the first episode. Right. And right. 
And in doing the right thing this time, they had her do it the wrong way and explain nothing. Explain nothing. Now, perhaps they could have gone at it like in that spur of the moment where she's feeling threatened or whatever. This she had a she had a uh, a trigger and she hands Helen the information and Helen, who's been known to be kind of a, a bad guy or at times played as the um, antagonist, could have said sorry, Lindsay. And and there could have been a conflict there, but no. They had Lindsay double down twice and say, no, I gave it to you. Like, and, ne and never explain it. Never explain why she chose that route. Remember, I, I, you'll, if you listen to the episode, you'll hear I was like, I have to believe that she has a, she's so smart that she has a reason why she right. did it that way. Right. It turns out, no, no, <laughs> nope, no. And had he not killed himself, had he not been so infatuated with Lindsay that he killed himself, he would have killed other people. I mean, it's pretty clear. He would have continued to kill, and it would have been Lindsay's fault for having put him back on the street yet again. But instead, because he kills himself, now she's sad because we're supposed to be sad. And so she throws a funeral, and the the guys like, "Aren't we all good?" And then they just they then they juxtapose that funeral with Bobby fucking the girl. Which look, as we discussed, nuance and gray area. I'm not I'm not opposed to Bobby being like, "I really have feelings for this lady," or "I'm still very lonely," or "Lindsay left me," so. But that's not the way they went with it. That's not what they said, which would have been believable, talking about straining credulity. Last week, they tried to do the switch of Ruby, the very last, a very powerful scene with Bobby and Lindsay, where Bobby's like, it's you, I love you. I wanna make this work for us and for our kid. It's not just for the kid, I love you. And she right. and she says, no, I'm in a different place. And so she, and so she, she leaves him, which doesn't mean forever, right? She's confused. But regardless, if Bobby really felt that in the moment, one of two things. He either would have not fucked Terry Polo or that scene between them would have been him saying, I'm lonely right now. I'm hurt right now. I want to retaliate right now. Let's get this thing going. Like, if you're still into it, let's do this. I need to forget myself. It's almost as if him going on a bender, get him, have him be blasted and, he, and then he makes a mistake and then, oh, well, how's that going to pan out? But no, they just flipped the script again or they have him say, I miss you, which we can read the subtext of, I've liked you from the beginning and all this, which means everything he was saying to Lindsay is, was bullshit, right? It pulls the rug out of Neith a lot of it. Now, I'm not saying you can't have feelings for two people. I, we can discuss the minutia of it, but I'm, it's television, right? And we talk often that we have to jump right to the plot points. So it, 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 it hurts me when the writing staff keeps writing conflicting subtext which just which which then lessens the impact of all of it so i'm now left keith and if you recall from the beginning keith has been remarkably consistent he doesn't give a got a good goddamn about who's fucking who and all of that bullshit that's not the stuff right. you were coming to this for that's right and i went the other way i found it i find it pretty interesting and i was championing them to getting together and i even could i even enjoyed the conversation last week about about infidelity and, and continued with Phoenix online. But now now I've reached the point of, I just don't give a shit. You know, like, Bobby, go fuck everybody. Who Like, what the fuck? Clearly, I guess Dylan has like two episodes left. So I don't know if they, they've already made the decision at this point to write him off the show or if that happens in, this, in, in the summer before next season. I don't know how the, all the, like I said, I didn't look into the politics. I still don't know. I'm, I can't wait for the episode where you educate me on what was going on behind the scenes. But it just seems like they're like, we have to get rid of this character. Because it's just not making any goddamn sense. It's just not making any sense. And so I, I, I hate the fact that I don't give a shit anymore. So that makes the episode feel kind of like, it sucks because I like the central, the, the serial killer stuff with Lindsay, same feeling. I just feel like that plot was run so thin, I don't give two shits. I didn't give two shits. I didn't find it sensational. I didn't find it anything. I liked the Jamie stuff, mostly because of the performances. And I thought that Lisa Gay did as best she could grounding the sensationalized stuff and pulled out some really great performances in the serious stuff. So it's not a waste of an episode. I'm a little disappointed in it. I have no idea what the Easter egg is with the, with the pirate doubloon. I can't wait to hear about that. Uh, but I think it's serviceable at best. I'm going to say 6.1, 6.13 spare tires. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, you said you kind of said it all. Um, there's a couple of things that I, I, I think I'll emphasize on what you said there about, uh, conflicting, conflicting messages from the writing staff. Asynchronous. Yeah. It's, and it, it feels, um, not just inconsistent, but conflicting because you, you have the, um, the Lindsay Deeks arc, right? Setting aside like the whole like 74th serial killer of it all. We did a two episode arc where we were like, we're standing on our principles. We are not going to give our client up. This is what we're going to do. There may or may not be a dead girl. There may be a live girl. The judge has given us an out and we are going to stay in prison for a long time in order to hold up this high-minded ideal. And I'm like, okay, great. I get it. The show's making a point about the, the bigger picture, the duty of a lawyer, the integrity of these characters. All right. Interesting. All right. That's the point. That's where they're going to stand on it. This is what we're going to, the story we're going to tell. And then this time is like, oh, nope, never mind. Uh, right. We're going to throw every piece of that out. And you also use the word, the trigger. And what triggers this change was pretty weak tea compared to what we've also been doing here. So I, I can even understand you want to tell the story that they're standing on this principle. Then you know what? Something so egregious has happened that we must change this. But we didn't get a good trigger on that either. We don't, you know, obviously we don't want him teaching in a high school. Uh, duh, obviously. But in terms of what would cause this giant change in both of these characters point of view it, it, the stakes don't seem high enough it doesn't seem emergent enough it doesn't seem like a like a trigger that makes any sense all right so uh the other thing i'll say about the deke story um and, and you could see this coming from a mile away from episodes away that we were going to sort of finish this arc with trying to have compassion for this serial killer, for a guy with mental illness, with challenges, um, you know, with him, we first meet him trying to get help, right? So mm -hmm. I understand like, okay, great. That's an interesting story to tell. Find a way to give me compassion for this serial killer. Uh, but again, with conflicting storytelling, we don't, we, you know, like we don't have compassion for this guy because like when he comes in, I need help. Great. All right. I can have compassion for the guys. Like I feel compelled. I don't have any control over it. But then when he pieces out after he gets off and then comes back and then becomes this weird thing, like, what are we supposed to feel compassionate for about this guy? Because he's got sort of a sad face. The actor has a, has like a sad affect to his face. Now we're supposed to feel bad for him. It was just badly done. I'm, I'm fine with it ending you know, it's telling a story that ends with Lindsay as the only person at a funeral. And there's a, there's a version, there's a way to tell that story where I'm crying at the end of that, where I feel this compassion, where I, I care. But this, this isn't the story they told because it was sloppy and not well done. So we end in the emotional place of where Mike is at, where I just don't care anymore. It's worse than hating it. I just yeah. don't care anymore. And that's not where you want to be. Um, the Jamie case I liked more um, because, as you know, I've talked about ad nauseum, when you're drawing uh, our attention to an injustice in the system and, and the way we treat victims in this case, um, that is an injustice. It shouldn't be that way. It's terrible. I'm glad we're drawing attention to it. The, the, the specific information we get that the rape shield does not apply to witnesses that's an injustice that needs to be fixed. I like having our attention drawn to that. But you, you, you see the age of the show showing up in our sort of accepting the fact that her sexual history is relevant in some fashion and is something to be ashamed of, something to be hidden. Yeah, looking at this from 2022 eyes, who gives a shit? who she's fucking, how many people she's fucking, and in what way. It, it It's none of our business, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. That's her choice. She can do whatever the fuck she wants, as long as it's consensual. When it becomes unconsensual, 
we we're we're here but it, it and, and you know she could she could fuck all of valtuna and it doesn't make a lick of difference in terms of what is consensual and what is not consensual and well um, and there was a lot of like impl and 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 once again it, there was a lot of implied judgment on eugene's part yes, like yes. how many sexual partners you have and you're like i'm like who gives a shit you fuck somebody on a ferris wheel who cares it's none, yeah. of, it's none of my business it has nothing to do with this case wild horses baby and and i think that that is um you know and that but that was very much the attitude of 2003 and i think the show to give it credit and we've shit on this whole season a lot but to give it credit i think this is a more progressive attitude than the era i i I think that the that this was starting to lean in the direction that we were headed and while i don't think it represents where we are today and i and i think it does send some of the wrong messages that we wouldn't want said today it is at least better than it could have been. And so I will at least sure. acknowledge that. Um, so, uh, you know, and Bobby fucking Terry Polo at this point, I, you know, I'm with you. I don't care. Who gives a shit, man? I don't care. It does like this. I'm not rooting for their relationship and haven't for a while. I'm not rooting. I, I feel bad for Lindsay mainly because of i feel bad for her writing i don't know it's a whatever i don't care uh so <laughs> and they've sort of given up trying to make any sense out of the terry polo character like she's spoken out of both sides of her mouth so so many times the whole like, time. You're, yeah and you're like, like well, everybody's a hypocrite everybody's a mess nobody's motivations are clear it's just it's the same thing there's a story to tell there that I'm going to be really in, emotionally invested in. It, it just wasn't told that way this time. So, and before there's any kickback from, you know, from the community that, well, that's real people, right? The, everybody's a hypocrite. Everything. To, I agree with that, but that's not that's not storytelling. That's not storytelling. That's that's bad well, writing. You can. It's conflicting writing. You. I mean, good writing can tell a hypocritical character's point of view in a way that is has its own internal logic even in the messy hypocrisy of it uh so uh yeah it, you know eh, 6.22 uh that's what you get so uh yeah there it is uh folks it is time to address two the episodes easter egg or three <clears throat> there are two two more episodes of season seven what are you gonna do how are they gonna do it I, I can't tell you. I'm no spoilers. And then I mean, you how know, could they? I mean, like, let's let's think. Like, how can they get rid of Bobby and completely obliterate the Lindsay character? I have well, an you, idea. You, you, well, you're also assuming that this is when Bobby leaves. So, oh yeah, that's true. Well, you, I've you, seen the cover art of season seven, and it has Spader on it. So, I mean, I guess he could come further in the season. So, right, we don't know. But uh, anyway, so I think it is time to address our Easter egg. Yes, it's gonna yes, make yes, yes, it's yes. gonna make sense when uh, when I explain it to you. Uh, oh, so Jillian we, is rehearsing or auditioning right now. She is she is rehearsing. Okay. That's that's uh that, that's what's happening. So, uh, so what do we have here? We have skull and crossbones and some thread, perhaps some loose thread. Uh huh. There's a loose thread with a pirate. Or is that poison? What is the skull and crossbones? It is death. We are killing off our loose threads. Uh, <laughs> so we're, we're not just tying them up. We're killing them off. So we lost it. two of our serial killers this episode. I love it. <laughs> and a marriage. Perfect. So yeah. killing them off. Killing off our Fair. loose threads. Okay. Uh, all right, folks. You have been listening to the Out of Practice Podcast. If you would like to reach out to us and talk about, you know, your thoughts and feelings about this, you can find us at Out of Practice Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Out of Practice Podcast. While you're at it, you know, hop on to Apple Podcasts or any other podcasting service and leave us a rating and review. Join the jury. You know, nobody has an years now uh so just surprise us you know why not give it a shot 
But you know who never ceases to surprise us? Our undying love for our founding sponsors, Jorge Novoa, Cloud Lover 69, Leanne Wrights, Jennifer Masanova, and Kari Kuhn. Hey, you want to give us money for that last season? You can still do it. There's still time, baby. In fact, are you listening to this in the future? Me and Keith have already finished this show. You can still give us money. One-time contribution, monthly contribution to help us with whatever shows we're doing in the future. You can find those links in our show notes or just watch our other stuff. Stick with us, guys. Uh, You're the best part of us. Well, not of us, but of like this (laughs) online thing we're doing. Hey, do me a favor. I'm going to need you to come to the morgue and identify a couple of dead serial killers. And then after that, I'm going to need you to go ahead and grab this laser beam and shoot off some laser sounds. Laser sounds.